perfect. So this is a, a very short introduction on, on uh, PRISPRs9 uh, uh, mutagenesis system. And actually, this is a, a site-directed mutagenesis system. So it means that um, uh, we can target a specific region of our genome to mutate. That's, the, that's the, what we are uh, using right now this, this technique for. Um, although there are many more variants and very creative ones to technically uh, do different th things. We can uh, not only mutate, but we can introduce uh, fragments of DNA, specific fragments, or even we can change um, certain uh, chromatin states uh, by uh, fusing uh, Cas9 with, with other proteins, and we can change a little bit the, the molecule of, the, of DNA. Changing, giving it uh, new functions, but uh, we, we are going to approach that a little bit later on. So um, I'll start with uh, talking about uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly, just because it's a way to approach why do we need mutations? Why, what's, what's the point, right? But at least in uh, life science, why, why, why do we want, we want to do it? Well, the objective is not create to create superhumans or super crops or super animals that will eventually change the the, the whole life. The, 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 our, our perspective is to better understand genetic code and its implications in, in, in development and in the function of, of organisms. And uh, we still have lots to learn. We, we, we I mean, and maybe we can eventually discuss this a little bit because uh, to change, to improve, requires a previous knowledge of how things work. And we, we, we are still not fully aware how the genetic code is encoded actually. Because actually uh, we had already very interesting uh, discuss discussions with uh, Gunther and Roland. Actually the genetic code is not only a code one code, it, it's, it has multiple layers of codes, okay? It's not only the sequence that, that, uh, that is uh, encoding information, but uh, it's where the sequence is, how the, the chromatin is structured and how is the, the architecture of the chromatin or, or the DNA is located within the nucleus. All this space, all this code, all this has information. And uh, we understand a little bit uh, the sequence, but uh, we are still exporting a lot more of the rest of the code. So to, just for you to understand the, the implications of mutations, I mean, this was uh, actually a historical mark uh, that was done by, by Thomas Morgan that basically allows us to associate where the um, information that passes from one generation to, to the other is located within the cell and it's located in the nucleus, in the DNA, okay? And this was possible because uh, Thomas Morgan, they, he started to grow lots of fruit flies. He was expecting to, to have in his mind an evolutionary jump from one drosophila to something a little bit different in a fast movement of the morphological change. And uh, actually he found it, but uh, his explanation for that later on changed to a mutation, to uh, a change in the information of, of, uh, of, uh, of the fly. And that, that happened with the, the, the appearance of a very nice, uh, beautiful uh, fly that had uh, white eyes instead of the thousands or millions of flies that he had that, that, that had uh, red flies. Uh, sorry, red eyes as a normal wild type uh, uh, fly, fruit fly should have, okay? So the appearance of this white fly allows him to associate this information that is the, the color of the eyes to a fragment within the nucleus that was the X chromosome of the fruit fly. Now we started to understand, this, is, this was the, the beginning of uh, molecular genetics. Now we started to understand that information is stored in chromosomes. Chromosomes, they, they have DNA and DNA have sequences. And that's, those sequences are part of the code that allows us to uh, uh, build organisms or uh, yeah, that is the, the, the roadmap to build an organism. So 
much more words were done using mutations to understand what was the role of those of that code. And part of the code, a uh, considerable part of the DNA, but not too much, actually it's, it's the minority of the, of the DNA actually encodes proteins. It's called, called the coding DNA. And uh, those are the active parts of, of the DNA. They, they really encode proteins because they will uh, be able to uh, encode amino acids that put together will generate a protein and a protein will do things into cells. But are, are there, because uh, more mutations and more mutants were uh, identified, um, very interesting uh, functions started to be uh, uh, observed, like uterobitorics, that is a gene that encodes for a protein that is very important for the for the uh, body plan for the formation of the body plan of the fly as you can see a normal uh, a normal fly has two wings okay but this guy that has this mutation basically uh, has now four wings what is happening here is that this gene is extremely important to give to one of the thoracic thoracic segments of the fly the identity of that a particular thoracic uh, segment. In the absence of, the, of this gene, the, 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 that particular uh, fragment of the, of the fly will appear as, as a rep replicate of this uh, thoracic uh, fragment. So the same uh, thing here, uh, ectopic expression of this uh, antinepidia uh, gene will transform antennas into, into legs. Okay. So this was a, a, a quantic jump in understanding the code. Basically, there are genes that are extremely important as uh, master, uh, uh, master control genes that will give the identity of certain segments of the fly. Oh, sorry, of the, of the, the organs of the, the organism. So, all these mutations were, were generated by uh, random chance. We, uh, as you were saying, uh, uh, radiation can destroy DNA, and that's a problem to keep uh, the information uh, intact. So it is possible to randomly generate mutations, just uh, destroying that information randomly using radiation, for instance. And that will induce modifications in the DNA, and that's okay, because uh, if we grow lots of flies and one fly appears that is different, for instance, has a white eye or a, a new pair of wings. What we want to, to understand is where the mutation is located because this is informative. We are messing up some of the fundamental programs of, of, the, of the fly in this case. Okay, but this is, this at the beginning of the, the, the last century, this was generated by random mutations doesn't matter where we are mutating because we don't know the code. We just want to accumulate uh, mutations and retrieve differences in, in morphology. And that's what we want to study. Now, nowadays we, we enter a new era. It's a new, a new concept. Now we have the code for many different organisms, including uh, our own. We know which is the sequence of every single nucleotide within the, our DNA, okay? And the paradigm has changed. Now, uh, what, what we know is that we have, for instance, uh, 20,000 genes in our genome, and we want to understand the function of gene one, gene two, gene three, or gene four. And for that, what we need is to go to the sequence of our genome and mutate specifically that gene. So we can understand what is the impact of the loss of function of that particular gene. And this is important because now think about it, uh, Drosophila at the end of the day has a set of genes that are very similar to ours, okay? At least coding genes. Now we saw that one mutation in one gene will give uh, a new pair of wings to the, the Drosophila, converting that so, uh, thoracic segment into the, the, the other one. What happens in humans, okay? Uh, are similar genes also responsible for the identity of uh, some uh, 
uh, anterior posterior above the axis or not? And that's a very relevant question. So what we want is to go to our genome or uh, an animal model genome, mutate uh, orthologous gene and see the outcome, the phenotypic outcome to understand better the, the function of that particular gene. So for that, we must perform targeted mutagenesis. And that's what CRISPR-Cas9 uh, give us as, as a solution. Just, uh, just a short introduction to the DNA or the, the code of the DNA. The DNA is it's a molecule, uh, can store information. That information uh, is stored in four different uh, re residues. Uh, it has four different flavors. It can have uh, uh, adenine, timine, guanine, or, or cytosine, and this is the basis of the code. Okay, so um, three nucleotides. So these guys are called nucleotides, and they are stored in the nucleus in the DNA. Later on, this information. So we have all the information in the DNA for all genes. Okay, genes encode proteins, but they represent only two percent of the whole genome roughly, okay? Then we have the rest of the, the, the DNA that was called the junk DNA, but uh, it has an important function to make available that information, okay? So the information is made available by transcription. So uh, from DNA, the, the DNA is transcribed into RNA, okay? And the RNA, now we have an active gene, active gene the RNA will be shuttled from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And the, in the cytoplasm, three nucleotides, A, T, G, or C, the sequence of three nucleotides that is called the codem, will, will encode for an amino acid. An amino acid is the, nu is the nuclear unit of proteins. So a chain of uh, different uh, amino acids will uh, create a different protein and proteins have a function. For instance, the function, uh, the, the, y, the Y gene encodes for a protein that is required for to give red color to the fly eyes, okay? So proteins do things in, in cells. Of course, uh, as we, we, as I, I was saying, so this is the, the coding part of the of a gene. So basically it will translate into a protein that will do things into in a cell. But then you have uh, the remaining 98% of the DNA that is not coding proteins, but it's essential to understand when the, the, the this information, when the proteins are synthesized and where, in which cells. And we have thousands of different cells with different identities. Everything is encoded in our DNA. So if, if you have uh, some questions, please go ahead and we can uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, this. So what, what we can do with, uh, with CRISPR is that we know that we have a certain gene that has a certain sequence. And what we want is to mutate this particular sequence in three gigabases of information that we have in every single cell of our body three gigabases of nucleotides correspond to 3,000 million nucleotides that are within every single cell that we have in the fingertip of, of my finger. We have thousands of cells there. And of them, they have 3,000 million nucleotides. Actually, double that because we, we are 2N. We, we have two copies of each. OK. so. Is revolutionary or not CRISPR? Conceptually, not so, because uh, there were already several techniques that were used to induce mutations randomly, as, uh, as we already discussed with, with uh, radiation, for instance. But target mutagenesis were, was already uh, able to, to, to be able to, to perform. For instance, by uh, homologous recombination using uh, embryonic stem cells in mice, or with other techniques like zinc fingers and talon that are very similar to CRISPR. Now, the problem is that these techniques require months of development of tools to be able to target a specific sequence in the genome. So you need to uh, fine tune and to build new proteins that will recognize a specific sequence that will then cut DNA and, and uh, mutate DNA, okay? But CRISPR, you can do it. And uh, that's what we are going to do in the practical 
part of, of uh, this uh, uh, workshop is we, we, we can synthesize and cut DNA and uh, we are going to show you that maybe we can do it in one or two days, okay? So CRISPR was found and as, uh, as uh, uh, Gunther was, was saying, it, it, it's uh, like a protection mechanism of bacteria. And basically it was found just because of, of a, basic, a very basic uh, interesting question that uh, uh, researchers found that, that in bacteria there was sequences that were that, that were uh, repeated okay and that were uh, that ha that have uh, about 29 base, base pairs nucleotides ATGs of Cs so there was a repeated sequence of 20, 29 nucleotides that was separated by 32 base pairs that were different. So repeat, different sequence, repeated sequence, different sequence, repeated sequence, and so on. This in the genome of bacteria. And this was quite interesting because it was a pattern. What, 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 what does this represent? Now, what was shown was that these 32 base pairs basically were not fragments of DNA of bacteria, but were fragments of DNA of some bacteria fetches, some virus that infect bacteria, okay? And turns out that when the phages infect bacteria, they inject their DNA into the bacteria, and as a normal uh, virus do, they will sequester the, the, mechanism, of the, the mechanism of the replication mechanism and the synthesis of protein mechanism to generate more virus. But sometimes these viruses fail to do that. They poorly infect bacteria and bacteria can survive. And in those cases, it, the bacteria will trigger a mechanism that will shop the DNA of the phage and it will introduce this small fragment of the DNA that will have, it will shop it in 32 base pairs and it will introduce this fragment of DNA into uh, this sequence of repeat tag repeat tag and now the DNA of the phage will be a tag, a tag to recognize the virus itself. Okay, makes sense? So now the bacteria knows the virus because it has a little bit of its, its DNA. Next time that the virus infects the, the bacteria, the, 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 the bacteria will synthesize all these different tags and the tag that is homologous to, the, to the, 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 the DNA of the virus will hybridize there. Now, the cool thing is that, so the RNA, it, the, the bacteria will transcribe RNA again from the DNA to RNA. The RNA will hybridize to the DNA of the virus, okay? And it will put together to, to those two things. Now, the cool thing is that bacteria will also synthesize a protein that has the ability to bind to, to, to to RNA, to the, this RNA that is being produced here. So it will, sorry, it will bind to this RNA and it will be carried to the DNA of the virus. This protein has a second function that is to shop DNA. So when the, the, the bacteria is transporting this, this RNA biomology that will hybridize with the DNA of the virus, the protein that is attached will start to shop the DNA of the virus and it will degrade it, okay? And this way, uh, the bacteria can actually survive to the viral infection. It's like uh, uh, an immunological response, although they are not antibodies. It's like a really basic molecular kind of um, uh, reaction. So uh, the... the so what, what we call to these guys, to the, to the fragments of, re, of RNA that will hybridize to the virus DNA, they, they are called the single guide uh, RNAs. They, they have a scaffold that allows Cas9, these uh, RNA binding slash DNA shopping uh, kind of protein. And uh, this will allow the, the, the protein to bind to the DNA, the target DNA shopping it. Of course, the trick here is the information that is contained here, the sequence, okay? So this will allow the, the Cas9 to target specifically to the DNA of the virus, okay? 
Okay, so this was a very basic mechanism found in bacteria, but the question was, well, maybe we can uh, uh, apply this kind of mechanism to eukaryotes. That's what, what, uh, what uh, uh, has been happening uh, recently. And I mean, as you saw, the previous techniques required the development of highly specific proteins to bind a specific sequence of DNA. Here, the only thing that we need is a sequence that is equal to the sequence of the target region, okay? And we only need to synthesize only one protein that is always the same, okay? It's only the RNA that will change. And the design of the RNA is quite simple because it will be exactly the same sequence that we want to, to cut. And that's the, the principle. So we have two components, the single guy RNA, that will bind to our target region, okay? And this RNA will have a scaffold that will allow the binding of the protein, Cas9, and Cas9 will bind to the RNA that will bind to DNA. And because it has this uh, shopping DNA ability, it will generate a double strand break. It will shop the DNA. Now, the cool thing is that that happens. Radiation, as, as uh, Gunther was saying, can generate double strand breaks. So, and we don't want that because if mutations can give rise to diversity, that is true, shaped by uh, natural selection, they will they can also give rise to diseases, right? Because if we disrupt uh, an important sequence, the individual won't have a progeny, it will be quite messed up. So we, we have mechanisms of uh, DNA repair. These double strand break, breaks happen. They are happening all, all the time, but we have the ability to repair these, these double strand breaks. Now, the problem is that the mechanism of repair is not 100% uh, uh, error proof meaning that when our re DNA repair machinery tries to repair this double strand break, sometimes commits errors and uh, either can uh, delete nucleotides, ATGs or Cs, or can introduce random nucleotides. And this is what we call uh, indels. If we introduce one nucleotide or we delete one nucleotide or we change one nucleotide, we are generating a mutation, okay? Now, the problem is that where are you generating the mutation? Of course, if we are going to generate a mutation in a, in a sequence that encodes for a protein, and the, 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 the problem is virtually the same. So we need a codon frame, we need a, a certain kind, a certain number of rules so that proteins are trans, properly translated, okay? If we hit this 2% of the DNA, the, the, the chances are quite high that the implications will be severe for, for the cell because we will change the, the code of the, of the protein. And again, proteins do things, important things in cells. So, um, yeah, as you can see here, this was the, the first paper, the first publication that where it was shown that uh, it was possible to use this kind of mutagenesis mechanism or side directed mutagenesis mechanism uh, or technique in the zebrafish genome. And, and uh, as you can see, the original sequence is here. The sgRNA was targeted to this yellow fragment. Then you have the PAM, that is uh, NGG, but this is actually the, the part of the DNA that, that we need to transcribe, okay? And apart from this, we need to put a, a, a scaffold in the RNA so the, that the Cas9 will bind to these points. But this is the, 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 the sequence that we need to, to transcribe so that we can target Cas9 to this particular region of the genome. After cutting, you can see that we have introduction of new nucleotides in blue or deletion of nucleotides of this original sequence. This is the original se sequence. And this is after the cut of Cas9, okay? We have introduction of nucleotides or deletion of nucleotides. And for sure, this is a mutation. This will be 
over and over again replicated and will be transmitted to other cells when cells divide. And if this happens in the germline of the organism, will be, will, will be uh, passed to the next generation of uh, the, the, the organism. Okay, so uh, CRISPR can be, we, we were talking about this kind of uh, introduction of mutations um, that can generate indels, introduction of nucleotides or deletion of nucleotides by this uh, default, by this uh, unprecise repair that is inherent of our repair machinery. But we can also introduce very specific changes by tricking our repair machinery. If we put a template with the, exactly the same sequence that we have here, okay, but with, with just one nucleotidic change, we can trick our repair machinery to read and repair our, our DNA by introducing this, this change. And this will be uh, not a random uh, modification, but it will be a precise uh, introduction of, a, of a, a nucleotidic modification. Using the same uh, principle, we can introduce homology arms to uh, introduce uh, exogenous fragments of DNA. For instance, uh, as, as, as Gunther was saying, uh, exogenous uh, RFP encoding protein that will be translated uh, eventually into a protein that is uh, red fluorescent protein. We can put that specifically in a particular part of the genome using these homology arms. We can do it randomly, just introducing these fragments of DNA, or we can engineer the, the protein Cas9 so that it changes its activity. Instead of shopping the DNA, so let's uh, change the structure of DNA in particular region where the Cas9 is being targeted at, okay? For instance, making the DNA more available. Because think about it, it's the availability of the information that matters. Okay, when the genes are activated, when the genes are repressed, and these will have important implications into the cell. We can force some genes to be activated, or we can force some genes to be repressed using these variants of, uh, of uh, Cas9 that will have these activating or repressing domains. Okay, and, and this is it, uh, a very short introduction, how the systems work and why do we need it for uh, uh, basic uh, research in, in genetics. If you have some questions, please shoot. I think there are a lot of questions. I really thank you. Thank you so much because I, I, this this really cleared it up for me. Even though I have some background, I really this was also a bit of a magic a magic thing that happened there. But if I understand correctly, the 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 modification is so is not really due to CRISPR itself, but it's more due to the repair mechanism. Yes, I mean the 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 fantastic thing of of uh, CRISPR is that we have the ability to say where in the 3 million, sorry, 3,000 million base pairs in our genome, we can say that we want to mutate it here. And now we have all this information available. The, the human genome is sequenced and we know where the genes are to understand the function of the genes or to modify these genes. We need to target the mutagenesis to specific regions of the genome. And we can do it with CRISPR. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, great presentation. Uh, say cool to have this overview. Thanks. I think it's good to mention that this repair mechanisms, which we see now, kind of work because you do it in a cell. So you use the mechanisms that the E. coli or whatever organism you're working with, uh, with has to repair the DNA. But of course, we do it in vitro now, so we yes. cannot uh, we cannot rely on any cell mechanisms. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the other part. It, it must be uh, to, for the repair mechanism to work. It must be really in vivo. But as you as you do it, you, you basically bypass that by uh, mimicking the repair mechanism using uh, uh, error, uh, so PCR a PCR technique. So basically, you 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 bypass that by amplifying the DNA after shopping the DNA. 
Yeah. But yeah. The, 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 the main point of our practical approach, I, I think it will be to demonstrate that at least in vitro that we are able to tar target a specific region uh, of a fragment of the DNA and we can do it very precisely. And uh, well, talking about precision, and uh, this, is, this might be an important piece of information because maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit simplistic in, in saying that we can be very precise and we will mutate only one specific region of the genome, although we cannot control very well what modifications we are generating in that particular region. However, the, the mechanism of CRISPR is also, has also imprecisions. There's imprecision in the repair, but also, there's also imprecisions in the targeting. We know that uh, randomly, Cas9 might also uh, be active in other regions of the genome, okay? Not with uh, that high frequency as in the target region, but it might also induce other mutations in other regions of the genome. Technical implementations or innovations are trying to avoid that, but uh, yeah. Error is also inherent to the CRISPR technique. Uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you for the fantastic presentation. Um, are there more questions? I still have a few questions, but I don't know. <laughs> Please. Yeah, um, I was wondering um, because you you stated that we already tried to put the like a fluorescent protein like the the, the insertion. What what's the maximum of the insertion you could place in uh, with with CRISPR? Uh, you 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 can do it. Uh, I, I, I'm not I'm not uh, remembering any publication right now, but uh, I'm remembering the some publication. Uh, any publication that that describes the, the the maximal length, but I remember some cases that you can put perfectly coding genes and a regulatory element, so uh, we can do it two KBs, three KBs, and so on. But this is not a trivial thing. It's not a trivial thing at all. We are trying to do that in zebrafish, that is the animal model that you we use, and we are trying to do it for a very particular region because what we want is to tag proteins, these important proteins that uh, actually they, they control the, the identity of segments. But basically, they will control the activity of other genes that will have important functions by controlling the, the identity of cells. And what we want is to tag these proteins so we can pull down and, and see where these proteins are binding in the DNA and understanding which genes they are activating. And we are doing this by putting tags, by putting fragments of DNA in these genes that encode for these proteins so that we can pull down these proteins. And it's, it's I mean, it's a couple of years of really headache and uh, it's, it's not trivial, but it's possible. So in theory, we could actually put a few pixels with CRISPR right in the place we want to hide it in the genome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 sure. Very cool, very cool. thank you very much. Um, uh, I have another uh, uh, question. Uh, um, we're also looking at a type of abstraction, but uh, uh, in your slides. But um, uh, I was I was wondering how that happens, where you show the scaffold uh, and and the blob of the protein, the cos protein around that. Um, Looking at the image, uh, it, it looks like um, a um, symbolizing a very physical process uh, in which a lot of um, codified things happen. Um, is this cos protein indeed having this, uh, and I don't know whether I use the right words, plasticity that it specifically needs this form of a scaffold? Uh, where it then hooks on, uh, yeah. like it's a, a piece of plastic floating in a river that then um, finds um, a root or a stick or a plant where it specifically can hang on. Yes, basically the, the function is uh, inherent to the to the form of the to the shape of the protein. 
Yeah. So uh, it, it, it needs to bind, and all these are the um, intermolecular uh, charges that are putting together all these molecules. Uh, and indeed, the protein the, needs to have these two functions, to bind to the groove of the RNA that has a shape. All this is, 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 is like that, shapes that bind to other shapes. And it needs also to bind to the DNA and have the ability to cut it. But, but the, the shape of the protein is essential for that. Yeah. So, so using this protein or another type of protein or another type of virus that uh, uh, changes the DNA, not only, only changes the, not only potentially can change the function of the DNA, but also the form um, by which uh, other proteins or a specific protein then can hang on and yes. start to do its work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everything yeah, well, is, is, is a really physical thing. It's not uh, an abstraction. It, it's a really physical molecular interaction. Yeah, sculptural. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, but most of the science behind this is, uh, um, is, is a science of understanding how this codifies for certain forms, because uh, are you, is there any possibility to to see this, to make this visual under a, a microscope? Yes, actually, because... um, th there's a movie that uh, by using atomic force microscopy, and if you want to, yeah, th this guy, are, are you seeing? So, yeah. so go go to this paper. It was it was it's a, a really fantastic paper because it shows the dynamics. I mean, it it, it was not recorded as a movie. It, uh, it was recorded as a different time lapse from different events that were going on uh, in the moment of the cut of the DNA. But basically, represents quite well visually how Cas9 is doing that. So if you have in this publication the the movies that were reconstructed using this uh, atomic force uh, uh, microscopy uh, kind of capture, and uh, you can see it quite visually how Cas9 cuts DNA. Mm -hmm.